to get us started uh, this morning, I'm pleased to introduce our opening speaker, uh, Dr. Michelle Cadieu. And I just want to point out uh, for the record that when we first discussed shifting EdConf 2020 to be online in this unprecedented period, uh, she said, but what if just a dozen people sign up? And I just want to say that I was right and you were wrong. Thank this you, time, This time. Great to start a talk that way. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, who is uh, um, Dr. Michelle Cadieu? She is a course coordinator for introductory psychology at McMaster University, and she helps to teach over 6,000 students every year. 6,000, that's right. And you're going to hear more about how we pull this off and uh, try to provide a high-quality educational experience. So about two-thirds of all students that go to McMaster University at some point in their academic career take one of our introductory psychology courses. So Michelle's primary research involves investigating the best methods and practices for instructing um, this large class at McMaster University. And her position puts her in the front lines of exploring what can be done to help students transition to university life and achieve their academic goals. So that's a big challenge for us. So we have so many different students from many different academic backgrounds taking our level one uh, psychology course. And part of you know, our mandate is helping them transition uh, to university life. She examines how different course structures can promote or hinder learning while paying particular trend interest to the role that online learning now plays in many large classrooms. And we're, I think we're going to see uh, a big shift, obviously, towards this in the fall term and beyond. Uh, she's most interested in how to improve overall student engagement to prevent students from being lost in the sea of first-year undergraduates. Okay, so with no further ado, I will pass you on to our opening speaker, Dr. Michelle Kedia. Hey, well, hello everyone. So I am Michelle Kadir. As Joe mentioned, I'm the course coordinator for Instructory Psychology as well as one of the instructors. I've been in this position now for seven, eight years. Never really remember, I lose track of time. But in that time, I've learned a lot about teaching a large introductory course, which can be a bit of a unique experience. There's differences between big classes and small classes, and today what I want to do is just share some of that knowledge that I've learned over the years. Specifically, I want to talk about the things that worked for us, the things that didn't work for us, and the things that just weren't worth the effort. So in other words, they may have kind of had the desired outcome, but behind the scenes they were an administrative nightmare. And so my goal is to sort of give you guys some of the practices that we've built over the years so that if you want to apply them to your own class, you're not starting from ground zero. So before I get started on all that, I will introduce you to what we do here in Mac Intro Psych. So we are a blended learning class. Uh, so what that means is we have both online and in-person components. So all of our students are required to watch web modules. Um, they're assigned one or two web modules a week. These are related to whatever content we're covering that week. They're accessed through Desire to Learn um, or D2L or McMaster's branding of it, Avenue to Learn. So you may hear me talk about Avenue a little bit throughout this. It's really just D2L. Right, so they have to watch these web modules. Then they also have an in-person lecture with either myself or Joe Kim. Uh, these are what I would consider slightly more traditional lectures in the sense of it's a first year introductory class, so they're huge. Um, as Joe mentioned, we teach about 6,000 students over the course of the year. These break down into classes um, usually of about 2,400 uh, for each actual course in a semester. And so these are broken down into four lecture sections. And so we have four sections of 600 people each. So these are sort of your typical idea of giant introductory lectures. Uh, these are then complemented by a much smaller, more intimate tutorial section. So all of our students are broken down across about 100 tutorials of about 25 people each. Um, so given the number of tutorials, we have a massive army of TAs that helps us with all of this, which is just fantastic. And so I'm going to talk about this um, 
five. So sorry, Joe just did something and it messed me up a little bit. Okay, so the goal of this talk is I'm going to go through each of these three components and talk to you about the evolution of it. How did we get where we are? Where did we start? Where did we go wrong in that process so that you can learn from the different things that we've done? So I'll go over web modules, the in-person lectures, and tutorials all in their own little section. So first off, we will start with the web modules. My tagline for this is over 15 years of work and still improving. And that is very, very true. So with this new sort of pivoting to online learning and everything that has happened with COVID-19 and we're all working from home and there's going to be so much online stuff happening in the fall at many institutions, some of you may be wanting to create web modules. And I'm here to say that creating something like what we've done overnight probably isn't going to happen. Uh, we've spent 15 years on this content and we're sort of in a lucky spot where we already have a lot of high quality online content. But at the same time, I'm going to try and show you guys what you can do in the time that you have. So first off, let's introduce one of our web modules. Oh, but before I start, um, there is a Q&A for those of you who have joined a little bit after we explained. And so you can put your questions in there and then I'll answer them at the end of my talk if you have any. All right. So this is one of our web modules. It has a main screen that has slides. Um, they, students can pause and play them, they can skip slides, they can adjust their volume. There's then a narrator panel as well where you can see the narrator um, if we've decided to film those sections. And there's a lecture outline tab where they can see all the different sections to be able to quickly move between them. There's also a note section that contains a full transcript of everything that our narrator Joe Kim is saying, as well as a resources tab that has um, interesting links or facts or videos related to the content that we're presenting. So it's not testable material, it's just cool stuff that we wanted to add. So this is the general idea of what a web module is. So how did these get started? Well, let's start at the very beginning. So we have a young Joe Kim, right? It's 2007. He's fresh off a postdoc looking for excitement and he gets hired at McMaster University, which is awesome. And he was hired specifically to take over introductory psychology. Now, Joe Kim had some very big shoes to fill. So he was taking over for Dr. Dick Day, who is a bit of a legend in our department. Um, and he'd been teaching introductory psychology for several decades and had the similar issue that we have, which is very large enrollment, right? Introductory psychology has always been really popular and he had hundreds of students that he had to teach. And so doing the traditional three lectures a week wouldn't really work with that number, especially because at the time McMaster didn't have the giant classrooms that we have now. So he did what any innovative professor would do and he actually started creating pre-recorded lectures. He basically made what we would consider now online content. Naturally, this is before the days of really online, and so they were all on VHS tape. <laughs> the typical experience of a first-year student, and I would know because I was one, I actually took introductory psychology with Dick Day. What would happen is you would go to a lecture or to a tutorial room, really. Your TA would give you some quick introduction, and then they'd slip a VHS tape into the VCR. It would come up on the projector, and you would watch a lecture. These were actually, if I'm being really honest, amazing. Um, not just for the time, but just in general. They were interesting and entertaining, and I'm a little biased because I love psychology, but they were really good. They were a great solution to this problem. So Joe Kim's goal, however, was to take this and move it online. So Intro Psych was moving online, and he had to develop web modules. Now, I found out that Joe Kim was actually hired in July, I believe July 1st, for a September start. So this meant that he was making these web modules literally on the fly, getting them out two weeks before the content. And needless to say, this was an incredibly difficult task for Joe. I am sure that there were weeks where it just wasn't happening in the way that he wanted it to. 
but he made it through. So he spent basically an entire year doing nothing but pumping out web modules, which is obviously a difficult and time-consuming task. And so we're going to say, well, all the things that went wrong with this first iteration of the web modules. So the first set, right, that first experience of students with the web modules, what was wrong with them? Well, for starters, they were way too long. Um, and this is a common mistake that people make when producing online content. So the web modules were originally designed to be about 15 minutes to an hour long. So matching up with what you would consider a traditional lecture. Now, this is, um, this is difficult for students to get through in an online context, right? So when we were doing the videos, right, with Dick Day, we kind of had an anticipation of it, right? You'd go, you'd sit in a lecture room, and it was sort of designed to be 50 minutes long. But that didn't transfer over as well to material where students that were expected to watch it on their own when they were at home, maybe still in their jammies. 50 minutes was just way too long. And so now all of our web modules are closer to 35 to 40 minutes. And this is much more manageable for students. The next thing that went wrong with these was the original design was just one continuous stream. So it's kind of like how you would think about a lecture, right? Yes, we break up our lecture with things, but we're basically talking for 50 minutes. And it was the same way with the videos. The videos were generally one continuous stream. And so the web modules were designed that way as well. And it turns out that this is also very difficult for students to manage. And so instead, now all of our web modules are broken up into units. Each web module has anywhere from sort of five to ten units, depending on the content. Each unit has a designed introduction and conclusion section, so that it kind of is its own little chunk as part of the larger picture. And this really helped. In addition, at the end of every section, at the end of every unit, is also two or three quiz questions. Right, little reflection questions that students can think whether or students can gauge whether or not they actually learned the material, whether or not they understand the material that was just presented to them. So this does a couple of things. First off, it provides students with an opportunity to reflect on the material that they just learned. It's also something that we tend to naturally do in our lectures, or at least good lectures. Right, where we have sort of little built-in breaks. And for some odd reason, when we're building online content, we forget about that. We forget about the natural breaks that occur during a lecture. And so it's really important for you to build those in. It also provides students with a stopping point that isn't just right in the middle of content where they can get up, get a glass of water, go to the bathroom, just do something. Right? Or a stopping point if they don't have the time to watch the entire web module all at once. So this is definitely one of the most important things when creating online content. Make sure that you build in breaks so that it's not just one continuous stream and students have the time to reflect and, and think about the material that they just learned. So the last thing, and sorry Joe for this one, but they were just plain boring. Uh, the content was super, super dry. Um, it was basically, it was well written. It contained a lot of very important facts, but it just wasn't fun. And this is something that we're very guilty of when creating online content. So when most of us lecture, we try to be entertaining, right? We try to enjoy ourselves. We add personality to the mix. Oh, sorry about that. We add personality to it. It comes naturally. Maybe we'll tell some jokes or say a funny example. But when we create online content, we a lot of times forget about that, right? We write out some very good, clear examples and, and content, and then we narrate it and read it over top of slides that loses some of the spunk that makes a lecture interesting. And so now what we do is we're trying to add that back in. So you can do it in really simple ways. So for example, 
all of our modules now have a funny photo of Joe Kim and a interesting and hilarious fact about him. It adds some personality back in. On a more ambitious note, Joe and I are now also making short video skits, right? They're funny, they're entertaining, they show off Joe and my terrible acting, and they're relevant to the material that we're covering each week, right? We make fun of ourselves, we deeply make fun of each other. It keeps it interesting for students. These videos occur at the beginning, middle, and end of the web module. So it breaks up the content a little bit more and adds something fun. These are a big investment for us, but students are responding really positively to them. So they're worth it to add a bit of energy to our online content. So my advice, if you are going to create online content, which a ton of us are for the fall, the first thing is start simple, right? A series of interactive web modules is not going to be built in a few weeks. It's just not possible. Joe spent an entire year doing nothing but really building these web modules with a team full of people, right? It's not something you can just do. And so my advice is pick something smaller that you want to accomplish. Maybe you want to make two or three web modules that are about core important foundational content that you want to, that you really want to have. Or maybe you decide to make a series of shorter presentations, right, that are five, ten minutes long that you'll show weekly that are about important concepts from that week's material. Right? Or maybe you don't want to make interactive web modules. Maybe you just want to make sure that the lecture content that you're creating for online next year is really good with good visuals and good sound quality and all of that kind of stuff. But either way, pick smaller things that you want to accomplish and get those done. And then, of course, build on that every single year. Right? Keep making it better. All right, so the next thing, and this is really important, is be your own narrator. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, but I hate the sound of my own voice. Honestly, welcome to the club. We all hate the sound of our own voice. Anytime I hear myself recorded, I think I sound like a pixie. It's, it's pretty awful. I'm really sorry for all of you out there right now. But being your own narrator solves the problem of what happens when you need to update. So I've seen this happen a couple of times where faculty members have hired somebody else to narrate their web modules, whether that be an undergrad, a grad student, a research assistant, a random member of the community who just has a beautiful voice. And then, you know, they record everything. It's great. It sounds wonderful. And then the next year they realize there's an error, right? Maybe a student brought it to their attention, but they realize, oh, I have to change it. It's not a lot, though. It's just, it's just these two lines. Well... Now you have to try and track down that person. Maybe they've graduated. Maybe they've moved on. Maybe they've changed their phone number and never want to talk to you again. Either way, it now makes making that update incredibly difficult. However, if you're the narrator, then it's really easy. You just re-record those two sentences and stick them in. Right? You're the only person who is guaranteed to always be there for the entire time that this content is being used. So. My advice is be your own narrator. It'll really simplify your life. And thinking of updates and everything else, this is a part of web modules. Honestly, you're going to create something beautiful. You're going to be so proud of it. And then you're going to have to update it. Right? Something is going to happen and you're going to have to make changes. Keep that in mind when picking your platform. Some platforms are better than others when it comes to making changes. And so think about it and think about what you're trying to produce and don't just jump on something. Make sure you understand what will be involved in making changes. If you have a media specialist, which we are lucky enough to have, her name is Paulina and I love her, she makes a lot of our changes for us. And so that simplifies our life. And so it's really about what works best for her when it comes to changes. But there are different platforms that allow for different things. And the last thing is don't do it alone. Right? Joe Kim has always surrounded himself with wonderfully competent people, and <laughs> that has made his life easier. There have been undergrads, graduate students, faculty members, staff, media specialists, all kinds of different people who have played a part in this project. 
They've all been very important in creating content, getting things off the ground. And so look for help and specifically look for resources. Right now, institutions across the world are dumping funds into creating online content because they know that we all have to do this in the fall. And so see what's available at your institution. See if there's some funding that you can take advantage of to maybe hire a few people to be able to help you out with this. Right? So look for that help and resources. See what's available to you before you dive in. All right. So that's it for web modules. Right? And I've gone over a lot of stuff, but it's the idea that you can make it work. Just start at the beginning and build from there. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is our lectures. So as I mentioned before, our students have one in-person lecture a week. Um, there are usually these giant classes of 600, but we have taken a slightly less traditional approach to that. But before I get started on that, I want to say that we didn't always have a lecture. Um, trying to lecture to 2,400 people is a lot. So when this class first started, students actually only had the web modules and then a tutorial. And that was it. However, uh, after some bargaining with McMaster, and there was bargaining because trying to find space on campus for 2,400 people all of a sudden isn't always the easiest thing, they did grant us an in-person lecture. So this is what the average student's week would look like in our class. Basically, sometime between Monday and Thursday, they would have a lecture. They would also sometime between Monday and Thursday have a tutorial. And then they would also, every single student has a weekly quiz on Fridays. Uh, these are short, low-stakes quizzes. Uh, they're done on Desire to Learn. They are 10 multiple choice questions, and each one is only worth about 3% of their final grade. And it's only about the content that we covered that week. So. This was okay, it worked, students loved the lectures, that was great, but it meant that students had a very inconsistent experience depending on what their schedule was, right? Some students had lecture on Mondays and then tutorial on Wednesdays, others would have tutorial on Tuesdays and lecture on Thursdays, which means they'd have their lecture content the day before their quiz and they'd have their tutorial before they even had their in-person lecture. Granted, our tutorials are primarily based on the web module material, but still, it would have been better if students could have an in -person, their in-person lecture before their tutorial in case they had questions for their TAs. So when you have a large class, consistency of student experience is really important. You want all of your students to kind of have the same experience, the same opportunity, the same learning environment. And with this schedule, that wasn't really working. So again, after some negotiation with McMaster and quite a bit of help from quite a few people, we managed to get this new schedule. All right, every single student now has their lecture sections on Monday. This means that between Joe and I, we teach 2,400 students on Monday for one of our classes. It's obviously... It's a big day, I'm not going to lie, um, especially if one of us is sick and you have to do sort of four lectures, it's a bit of a thing, but at the same time, it's really nice. It means that if we have any important announcements that we need to make, they all happen on Monday, all of our students get the same experience where they have lecture on Monday and now tutorials sometime between Tuesday and Thursday and their weekly quiz. So every single student now has their lecture section before their tutorial. It also made for some interesting kind of um, things where if we had a snow day, right, it's either nobody missed their lecture or everybody missed their lecture, which simplified things. Because I remember one year we had a lot of snow days. So this simplifies our schedule and, again, provides a consistency of experience. So now, about the lecture itself. My biggest piece of advice if you're doing a blended learning experience is to keep it fun. Keep your detailed content in your web modules, right? That's what they're there for. They're there to have your detailed foundational knowledge for students that they can go at their own pace, look back on, revamp, right? Like these, this is where that material belongs. Your lectures should be something different. They should be more fun, right? So we use our lectures for interesting demos case studies, new examples to help students better understand the material. 
Right? And examples is kind of a fun one because in lecture, we can do examples that are relevant to maybe something that's happening in the news or online right now. Maybe there's a cool visual illusion that everybody's talking about, like that stupid dress from years ago, or is it white and gold? Is it blue and black? Who knows? But we could talk about that in class. These are the kinds of things you don't really want to include in your web modules because you don't want to date yourself. Right? Some of this content you'll create now and you'll still be using years from now. And so your lectures, on the other hand, are a good spot for that. It's also a really good time to build that interest, that passion for the material. And for us, we get to do that right at the beginning of the week. Right? And so this lets students think about the interesting parts of what we're going to be learning about this week. It gets them excited about our class right from the start. And I think that's probably the most important thing about a lecture is getting students interested. Because if they're interested, they'll do better. Right? That is one of the major factors when it comes to student, su student success in a course. Were they interested in the material? And so we try and use our lectures to show them that everything we're teaching is at least partially interesting. Right, so that's it for the lecture content. Right, so again, my take-home advice for that is get your scheduling in order and keep it fun. Right, this is for a blended learning experience. This is where you should have kind of that pizzazz. So the next component of our class is tutorials. Right, and the important thing for our tutorials, my tagline is training and consistency is the key to success. And that is really, really true. So when we first started with tutorials, we didn't actually have any training or consistency, to be totally honest. Basically, what would happen is TAs were hired. Um, they were given the web modules, right? So this is the content we'll be covering this week and told to create a tutorial around that, right? Presented however they wanted. And this is actually my experience in IntroPsych. And I remember my first semester, I actually had a great TA. She was phenomenal, just excellent. The tutorials were great. I got tons of it out of it. And then I remember my second semester taking introductory psychology. It was less than stellar. Um, they had very little prepared material. I actually spent about two weeks in it and then switched, got into my old TA's tutorial. So there's an inconsistency where some TAs are just naturally good at this. And so we have dumped a huge amount of time, energy, and resources into training our TAs. So this is the smiling faces at you are all of our TAs from last semester. As I mentioned, we literally have an army of them. So we have about 40 undergraduate TAs. They are all in their third or fourth year of studies, uh, some in their fifth if you're taking a little extra time. And so basically what happens is if you teach in your third year and you do a good job, you are welcome to come back in your fourth year. Um, so this creates a di not a division, but two different categories of TAs. We have returning TAs, which we call our senior TAs, who've taught for us before. And we have our junior TAs, or newbies, who this is their first time teaching a course with us. And this is actually awesome. About half of our TAs are returning every year. And so it creates a bit of a mentorship where our senior TAs are there and new TAs can ask them questions, which is fantastic. It creates a good environment where they're helping each other. So now, as I mentioned, Training is one of the most important com components for our TAs. And this all starts with something we call orientation day. So this is a full day um, before classes start. And the first half of the day is admin training, basically. It's we teach our students how to enter grades, manage D2L, uh, organize their class lists, how, we, how they actually need to be grading students. It's an administrative day where we teach our students everything they need to know about actually running that course. The second half of the day, which these two top photos come from, is fun. It's community building. So we take them to somewhere called Altitude. This exists on the McMaster campus. It's a giant climbing tower. And students have to climb the tower. Um, I did it my first year. I'm never doing it again. It's really hard. 
but most of them make it to the top, which is awesome. It's also filled with team building activities and leadership roles and all of this other stuff. It's designed to help build the community of RTAs, which is really important because if you build community, then they'll help each other, they'll get to know each other, and they'll be more comfortable in their roles. But orientation day is just the start of their TA training. Every single one of our TAs is required to take a four-credit third-year psychology course called Psych3TT3. This course is basically teaching our students how to be a good instructor, how to be an effective communicator, right? There's a ton of professional development in it, but it's uh, they, it teaches them how to create tutorial material, how to write multiple choice questions, just a whole bunch of information about how to be an effective TA. Only our TAs can take this course, and it's taught by Joe Kim. So this is obviously a huge investment for us, but it's really worth it. Um, they get so much out of it, and it's such a highly <laughs> reviewed class. Like TAs love it, and it makes them better. It makes them more confident in their role. Finally, every single week, all of our TAs, new or returning, must attend tutorial preview. This is every Friday. And so what it is, is we have uh, a few TAs who, a couple of TAs who pretend to be TAs and present to the rest of the class. The rest of our TAs have to pretend to be students. They have to go through the activities, answer the questions, do the think pair shares, break up into group work. They actually have to run through the tutorial. And this is a great opportunity for them to, one, see how the material should be presented, to ask questions and get clarification on anything that they might be struggling with, and three, to debate, right? Sometimes we'll ask a question to our students and there might not be clear. Maybe there's two answers that we didn't think about. And so this provides our RTs an opportunity to contribute, ask questions, and work through the material. And then the slides are updated and shared with everybody. So all of our TAs are presenting the exact same tutorial to their students. And this, again, helps with that consistency of experience from our, um, from our students. Okay, so my advice for this, invest in your TAs. They generally have the most one-to-one -one time with your students. You want them to be awesome, right? This is the biggest example from my talk of absolutely worth it. We spend time and energy and resources on our TAs, but they make our class a million times better. They regularly get group ratings of over 9.5. They are regularly listed as one of the most important and valuable components of our class. They make us great. So it's important for us to help them in any way that we can. The next thing is to help build their network, to build that sense of community amongst your TAs. Even if you just have a small group, having them be in an environment where they like each other, they know each other, they're more likely to help each other. And this can really reduce a lot of the administrative load on you. So for example, RTs have a Facebook group. And if they have questions, um, maybe a quiz question that a student showed them or a question from tutorial or how do I teach something or whatever, they post it there. I'm part of the group. I can obviously contribute and, and weigh in as well. But to tell you, most of the time, before I even get to it, another TA has responded, right? And we actually have all of our TAs from previous years still part of this group. So TAs who've gone off and moved on can still answer questions, and they do, right? And so because they're part of that community, and they still feel involved. And so that helps them to help each other, which reduces some of the load on you. And the final point is find their passion. So some of your TAs honestly are doing it because it's a job. Some of them are doing it because it's an amazing job. And some of them are doing it because it's their passion. They love what they're doing. And one of our goals every year is to find those students, to find those TAs who are just amazing at what they do, want to contribute, and want to play a bigger role. 
so we can take advantage of that. We can hire them for the summer to help us build content. In fact, we've had teams who've just done interesting things with Photoshop to make creative stuff for our class, right? So these things are all ways that they can help. And so find those in your students, find those TAs, and get them on your team. Okay, so those are the three components of our class. And I would like to finish off this lecture with an example of something that we tried a few years ago that honestly turned out to be like a dumpster fire of a situation. It was awful. And then we made some changes and it turned out to be a complete success. So that is iClickers. Uh, most of you have heard about iClickers. If you don't know what they are, they are an audience response system. So they're basically a way to poll your class. When we first introduced iClickers, we decided to do it in tutorial, right? Decided this was probably the best place to do it. Um, we thought it fit really well with that, where TAs could quickly ask questions on the fly to their students, get great responses. Um, you could use it for participation because they're graded on their tutorial participation, so that could be a component. Um, it seemed like a good fit. <sighs> I get flashbacks just thinking about this. Okay, so this means that I had to train, or myself and um, Irina Gillick was actually involved in this project as well. Um, this is actually how we met, was over our original hatred of iClickers. And so we had to train 40 undergraduate TAs on how to use iClickers. Oh, man, did stuff go wrong. Um, yeah, because they had to learn the administrative side of iClickers. From the student perspective, it's easy. Register, hit a button, cool. From the administrative side, there's obviously things you have to do. And this was seven years ago, so iClickers have obviously come a long way since then. And this was just a nightmare. Honestly, it was the absolute worst. Um, it took the, from the student's perspective, it was actually pretty good from their side, but in the background, it was an administrative nightmare. Um, there was so much to do every week. It was taking hours of time. Fixing errors was incredibly difficult because we had a hundred sections that we had to try and track things down in. Um, we actually uh, wrote a paper about how bad this was. We got a HECO grant to, to test out iClickers and myself, Irina Gillick, Joe Kim, and David Shore wrote a paper about how terrible iClickers were. It was just awful. Um, so obviously we didn't do that again and we kind of forgot about iClickers for a couple of years. Then we decided to give it another shot and moved it to lecture instead. This went phenomenally. It meant I only had to train three people, myself, Joe, and our Conestoga instructor, Ellen, on how to do the administrative side of iClickers. iClickers had also come a really long way, and now they have iClicker Cloud, and basically I just have to download something from one website and upload it to another to get grades. It turned out to be really, really simple. And it had so many benefits for our class, right? One, it increased our attendance. So we use iClickers as a bonus opportunity, so they get bonus points for answering questions. And while we already had good class attendance, this made it so that even more students showed up because they wanted to get the bonus points. And also, we could use them to encourage students to watch the content ahead of time. Right, so some of our iClicker questions were related to the lecture material that we were presenting in person, and some of our iClicker questions are related to the web module content. So if they want to get those questions right, they had to watch the web modules ahead of time. And this is actually one of the biggest struggles that people have when teaching a blended learning course, is it can be very hard to encourage your students to watch the material before attending class. And iClickers fit that really, really well. They played a great role in encouraging students to do some work ahead of time. Finally, they were a phenomenal way to reach out to our huge lecture sections, right? We have 600 people. This was a great way to have students participate. They answered polls, questions, participated in demos. Heck, we've collected data in real time and replicated experiments that we're talking about in class because iClickers let you graph on the fly. So we would just show something and then be like, hey, look, this is real. Like, we can do this. And that's really neat for students. It also, of course, helps to break up your lecture a little bit, right? So it's not just you talking for 50 straight minutes. So my advice for using iClickers, first off, keep it simple. 
we you can use eye clickers to actually do real participation grades. Um, I know several instructors who are doing that successfully, but we tend to prefer to use it as a bonus opportunity. It decreases student anxiety revolving around those points. They don't feel that, oh, they have to get everything right and they need to study and, oh, what if their eye clicker didn't work this day or they forgot it or something. It just prevents that grade grubbing that can happen and makes things just a little bit more basic and it still improves performance. We like to use um, a tiered reward system and I highly recommend this for eye clickers. So basically, if you get to this many points, you get this. If you get this many points, you get this. Uh, for us, it's about dropping participation grades and quiz grades. So if they get the first level, they get to drop their lowest tutorial participation grade. Second level, that plus their lowest quiz grade. Third level, an additional lowest quiz grade. So that top tier is actually a pretty cool prize. And so students really do want to achieve that. But at the same time, if a student is struggling and missed a couple of lectures, it's not an all or none situation, right? They can still earn enough points to make it worthwhile so they don't kind of give up halfway through the semester if they had a rough start. The last thing is that points can be given for anything, right? And the interesting thing about iClicker points is they kind of became a bit of a currency in our class where we could use them to get students to do different things. Right. So, for example, our end of the year survey. Right. So all of us, um, if you're at a major institution, get, you know, your institution probably does some kind of course evaluation. But you all know that very few people answer these and it tends to be people who either love you or freaking hate you. I know that my official evaluations are either perfect tens or one with just horrendous comments because they usually have an issue with the sound of my voice. Probably it's because I sound like a pixie again, narrating. So. You want that middle ground for your evaluations because we all know that feedback is important. And so we have an end of the year survey on D2L that we give students five points for completing. Cost us nothing, really. Um, and about 75% of our class now fills it out. This gives us real feedback from that middle group. It also lets us custom design questions so they aren't the generic things on an end of the year evaluation where really we're all only looking at that effectiveness rating question. Right, so this lets us ask questions about our textbook, our lectures, everything. And so if we've made a change, for example, to our textbook, we can compare evaluations from one year to the next to see whether or not it actually made a difference. So if you do plan on including eye clickers or really any kind of um, audience response system, I really encourage it, especially for bigger classes. Um, it's a great way to just get your students involved. So my final words for pivoting to online learning. Well, as Joe mentioned, we are obviously in a stressful time um, with a global pandemic and a lot of us needing to teach online in the fall. It's stressful. And this is coming from me, who obviously has a huge amount of online content already prepared. And Joe and I are still sort of slightly scrambling to get everything done and figure out how we're going to live stream our lectures and live stream our tutorials. And do we have to change tutorial evaluations and how we grade and all of this other stuff? It is a huge thing. So I can only imagine where some of you are at with trying to create this content. So my parting words are, again, don't try to do everything all at once. Pick some things that are important to you. Get those done really well. It is way better to do two or three things exceptionally well than do 15 things mediocrely, right? Just concentrate on smaller goals. Also remember that it's okay to try something new and fail. Right? A lot of this lecture involved things that we did horribly wrong right? and how we fix them. We are constantly telling our students that it's okay to fail. Right? It's okay to not do something right. It's a learning experience. And yet we ourselves are terrified of it as well. We don't want to look stupid to our students. We don't want to do something that doesn't work. We don't want to do something that takes a whole bunch of time. Well, you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to be okay to try something new. And it's funny because this is coming from me. I'm not the person of new. That is definitely Joe Kim. Joe Kim is the dreamer of the two of us. And my goal is to sort of make his dreams come true. And so I'm not the most creative person. But and most of the time, I'm, I'm also very nervous about doing the things that Joe wants to incorporate. But I remind myself that a lot of the things that we've done have worked out great. And so it's important to keep remembering that. 
Again, don't do it alone. Look to your institution for resources. See what's available to you. And finally, every single year, try and make it better, right? Don't just develop some web modules and walk away. Look at your evaluations. Look at what you can do better. And every year, add something. Make something a little better, right? Keep building on that material. And eventually, you're just going to produce something glorious. Okay, that is it for me. So thank you so much for listening to a little bit about what we do here at Mac Intro Psych. I am glad that you, well, at least I hope that you all enjoyed my talk. I am going to have a quick look at the Q&A um, to see if anybody, I think Joe, however, has been answering questions, which is awesome. Okay, so one of the questions is, do you tell the students that you're trying something new and that you're learning along with them? Yes, um, absolutely. And so uh, some of you may be attending Paul Denny's session uh, later on today. He is the creator of PeerWise, which is a system that allows students to answer multiple choice questions uh, written by their peers. It's awesome. We use it as a bonus opportunity in this class. It's fantastic. And when we introduced it, we told students it was new, right? One year, we just said, okay, we're doing this. We have no idea how it's going to do well with um, how it's going to do with supporting the size of our class. It worked great. Um, future year, we actually did a study to see whether or not um, it does have any influence. We're still working out the data on that. And so, yes, we definitely tell our students when uh, we're trying something new. And that does make them a little bit more understanding as well. And most of the time, the new things we try, we try to put it as a bonus opportunity first before we make it a legit component of the course. That really helps. Okay, so did you ask students to buy iClicker or do they use their cell phones? Yes, we do ask students to buy an iClicker. Um, most of first year science at McMaster actually uses iClickers. It is the sort of audience response system at Mac. And so we didn't really feel bad about it because the majority of our students were already using them in three or four other courses. And so different institutes, different institutions, especially sort of higher end or um, university ones, have students um, who or have an audience response system in play, so you can do that. Um, iClicker also does have an app that you can download for, and it's a paid subscription instead that allows you to uh, use your phone instead of a remote. And that's what we're going to be doing next year, right? So because students aren't going to be physically there, we'll be exclusively using what they call reef polling um, for our students to still be able to participate in iClicker and um, earn the bonus points. And again, because it's a bonus opportunity, if a student doesn't want to do it, they don't have to. It's not a required component of this course. Okay, any thoughts on two-stage quizzes where students first take them individually, then with a group all online? It would help to build a sense of community and also give students quick feedback. So we actually do two-stage quizzes uh, for our iClicker questions. So all of our questions that are worth points, what we do is we have students enter a response individually first, right? And they get one point regardless of what they answer. Right, right or wrong, they get a point. We just want to see what they knew on their own, and we force them to lock into an answer, which is important for collaborative testing. Then we open it up to um, all students, right? And we say, okay, talk amongst yourselves, do what you want, discuss, and then enter your answer again. And they get a point that time if they answer it correctly. So this also helps students in our class get to know each other a little bit in such of our large lecture sections. Okay, right. uh, next question. Is PeerWise available to all other faculties at McMaster? Uh, yes, as far as I know. So PeerWise isn't actually a McMaster product. Uh, it is made by Paul Denny, who is from New Zealand, and he's awesome. Uh, it is free, um, and basically you uh, get an instructor login, and then you create a course and it runs itself. Uh, if you're attending Paul's uh, workshop, I'm sure he will talk obviously a lot more about it and all the benefits that are involved in uh, using PeerWise. But yes, it's available, and there's uh, hundreds of institutions, I believe, across the world now that are using it. It's fantastic. It runs itself, um, to tell you the truth. So, okay. 
Uh, describe how Reef can be used with Zoom lectures. Okay, so Reef polling is uh, completely online. So one of the cool things about iClickers and Reef polling is it doesn't need to be incorporated into your lecture in any way. Like there isn't slides you have to insert to have it work. Uh, iClicker, what it does is when you start polling, it takes a screenshot of whatever is on your screen. So if there's a question up there, you'll be able to see it and grade it later. And so all students need to do is, while you're lecturing, have the app open, either on their phone or on a laptop or whatever, and they can just participate in the polls in live time whenever you open it from your end. Uh, it's actually really simple. So we've been using a combination of the remotes and reef polling um, for the last few years. And so we've already been using the, the reef polling, but we just always allowed students to also have remotes because they can be a little bit cheaper if you buy them used. And so this was, um, yeah, this was a great way to uh, continue to give them that bonus opportunities because students really like iClickers. Uh, and so now we're just saying, okay, now instead of buying a remote or reef polling, you just have to buy reef polling. So that simplified things from, from our end. Okay, uh, next one is, next one isn't a question. Um, I will make an assignment for students weekly obligation for participation in Peerwise. So Peerwise, uh, again, this is a pretty cool um, uh, opportunity for students to write and answer questions. So we do it in two stages where students have to write and answer so many questions before uh, we have a bit of a midterm uh, partway through the year, and they have to write and answer questions before the final exam. And so uh, we give them specific deadlines, and I do recommend that, or else honestly they just do it all at the end. 